A man revered by Muslims and non-Muslims all across the world. For the Muslims, he is the cousin, the son-in-law, and the successor of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. For non-Muslims, he is loved because of how much of a justice, just ruler he was. That man was Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wasalam. Examples of non-Muslims that have that have mentioned Ali ibn Abi Talib as their topic of political discussion. For when you look at the United Nations and the likes of Kofi Annan, who announces that the letter Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, writes to Malik al-Ashtar of government is the best letter of government ever written by a human being. When we look at Gandhi, for example, and when he says that I do not allow anyone to enter my cabinet, had they not read the letter of Ali ibn Abi Talib to Malik al-Ashtar, and had they not fully understood it, because that letter highlights what equality is. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, who on the day of Khaybar lifted the, the gate by himself, who on the day of Hudaybiyah was announced as the soul of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But moving, drifting away from the merits of Ali ibn Abi Talib and looking at after the death of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his family, when we look at how he was oppressed and how he dealt with the situation that he was in. When Sayyidina Fatima alayhi salam and Sayyid Muhsin were killed in front of him, how he coped, how that affected him psychologically. This is the third of three uh, parts. And in this segment, we have brother Bilal Ali Hughes, who is with us today to discuss the psychological effect that losing a spouse can have on someone. Brother Salam Alaikum, how are you doing? Wa alaikum salam. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Now, brother, um, of course, the main uh, question on everyone's mind is that how how does it feel to lose a spouse um, have you come across of anyone who has lost a spouse and maybe who's lost a spouse for example to murder and how they coped with it I have in my travels come across many people have dealt with different types of uh, different types of loss a spouse, a wife, a husband, or vice versa, that loss is immense. Um, losing a best friend, losing like, when they, you know, we use the term colloquially in English, your other half. Um, it's, for some, irreparable. For some, absolutely irreparable. So, um, you know, one can only imagine if they haven't walked in those shoes. But we use our, our empathy as human beings to try and understand, to try and comprehend what that could be like by uh, processing the things that we, the losses that we have had in our own lives and how it affected us. So you talked about it being irreplaceable, the um, losing someone who's so dear to you, you know, who you spent pretty much most of your life with, who you've had your kids with. Um, how how would you say that they could come across, they could actually overcome uh, the challenge of losing a spouse? Uh, you know, are there any um, emotional coping mechanisms that you would suggest? There are, there are, there are a number. The first thing I, I would say that would be beneficial for people to remember uh, you know, people in situations are similar, people that have lost, mm. a, lost a family member or a spouse, um, is that for the best part, most people, you're not suffering alone because you're part of a configuration of people, you're part of a family. So it's important that family, that things like this pull family together and people become closer as opposed to allowing the stress and the distress to, to cause people to, to, to fracture, to cause fractures in the family. Because one of the most common things when we lose people, or when we lose in general in life, losses of a job, losses of an opportunity, losses of a friendship, 
is one of the first things that the human being reacts with is anger. That's quite often that we react. And that is essentially just a defense mechanism. That's just us um, trying to protect ourselves in a kind of psychological way. It's, it's pretty natural for that to happen. So you remember that you're not alone, if you're not alone, to share your f thoughts and feelings, at least confide with somebody that you mm -hmm. trust. So how would you say that, you know, um, some people, I mean, in fact, most people who have lost their spouse, who have been through uh, a loss such as this one, they, they would be s scared to talk to people. You know, they feel like it's hard that, to trust someone, mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't know who to talk to and who to turn to. So what kind of advice would you give to that person if they were watching this right now? And what kind of advice would you give them on how to learn to trust someone mm -hmm. and learn to be able to open up? I guess it's about trusting themselves. Mm. What, what people are afraid of a lot of the time is that by talking about it, by, if I suppress this, it's as if I, it didn't happen. Or they're worried that the floodgates will open, that if I start to talk about it, maybe I'll break down, I won't be able to cope, and I'm gonna fall apart. And I can't allow people to see me um, fall apart. It's, things like this will be particularly difficult, I'm sorry to say, but for men. Because we're taught from such a young age, you know, the boy falls over, and he's told, don't cry, you know, get up. Come on, be tough, be strong. The girl falls over. We comfort the girl. So that's in, that goes across many cultures, Western, Eastern, different cultures. So sometimes with masculinity, there comes this, this type of um, false invincibility. So we, so we need to be as human beings, not just as men or as women, but just as human beings, be able to own our vulnerability. Because then we, once we can own our vulnerability, we can take a real look at what our deficit is. That's the only way that we can go around work towards repairing it so we find trust in somebody that we know on a personal level and we trust ourselves that we can share and gain support it doesn't make us a weak individual to need support it means we're strong because we can recognize our, our shortcomings and also if we're dealing with professionals counselors psychologists psychotherapists there are strict codes of conduct with regards to confidentiality that they have to adhere to so they're not likely to because you know the fantasy in people's minds is if i tell a professional, this could end up anywhere, but no, there are strong, uh, as I said, codes of ethics um, regarding confidentiality. So they, they can feel assured in that if they're not familiar with talking therapy and things like that, mm, mm, that, that, mm. that will be kept private. Mm. Now, moving on from the, the effects of f losing a spouse and moving on to, for example, in the case of say the Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam and Imam Ali alayhi salam, mm -hmm. when we look at their children, Imam Hussein, Imam Hassan alayhi salam, say the Zainab, Um Kulthum, how how is it for a child losing their mother? Um, you know, as the Prophet, when the person, the man came and asked him, uh, who is um, who is better, my mother or my father? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He said, your mother, your mother, your mother, then your father. Mm -hmm. Now, how is it that a child of such young age, you, you know, Imam Hassan was seven years of age, Imam Hussein was six, um, how is it that they can cope with losing their mother? It's interesting because in, you know, they talk about children having the ability to adapt better than adults because they're not fully you know, psychologically, you know, the end product of what they are going to be. So in some respects, some would argue that it's easier for children. But I would say when it comes to a mother and from dialogue I've had with people who have lost their mum, you know, in childhood, um, never, never, ever, ever um, do you get over it as much as you learn to cope. Mm. So there is always that space and that void, but depending on what you're able to, if you're able to fill that space with something that's healthy, that's something that's productive, that's nurturing, then that can be productive. But unfortunately for many, it becomes uh, trying to cope with harmful methods like substance misuse and alcohol for st uh, stuff, things of this nature. So it can be really tough for children 
And um, as I said, we, we can only use our imagination to try and grasp what a loss of that nature would be like for a child. Mm, mm. Um, you mentioned that it's easier for a child to overcome um, this, for example, the loss of a mother. Mm -hmm. But when we look at, for example, you know, in the long term, when that child grows up, um, how would that affect them? You know, s seeing, for example, their friends that have their mothers around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how does that um, sort of gap in their life, how, how can they feel that? So that's when we look at what they call significant caregivers. So if the biological mother has passed, you would hope that with the extended family or if father remarries and the type of relationship that child would have with their stepmother, it could never be the same, but it could be a healthy um, alternative mm. to, to that mother. But um, I remember, I think I mentioned, we, we discussed this uh, uh, earlier on, um, that I spoke with a, with a, with an alim, a, a Sayyid, and he said that for all the places that he's been, for all the people he knows and all the things he's done and been, that's been available to him, the only, the real comfort he receives is when he goes to his, uh, to the grave of his mum and that nothing, nothing um, gives him that same feeling. Mm -hmm. As you said, you, 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 we quoted the prophet yeah, yeah, yeah. about who should I serve and who should yeah, I love yeah, and adhere yeah. to if I want to attain Jenna. And mm -hmm. you know, he said the mother, the mother three times, yeah, and then yeah, the yeah. and then the father. You know, we, yeah, we yeah. get a little insight when you speak to people like this. You kind of get an emotional yeah, yeah, insight. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, <laughs> I know this is pushing it on a little bit, but uh, for example, someone whose whose mother, for example, is buried abroad where they're not with them, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, where they can't visit them, visit them frequently. Um, you know, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's watching this, who's, for example, who lives here, but their mother's buried in, for example, in Iraq or Iran or mm -hmm. those parts of Asia or yeah, all around the yeah, world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is an interesting question, interesting dilemma in some respects, because obviously people, most cases, would like to physically visit that place because it's the connection, it's a kind of connection point on a spiritual level with that person. I think that people having their own, what we would call methods of self-care, whatever it is that's halal that helps you to feel better is something that is worthy to employ, to understand this what self-awareness becomes important. Um, you know, so people will have different methods. They may say, okay, I, my mother is not in this country, um, buried in this country, for example, but my aunt is here. And because she, they were so close or there's that kind of connection with, with this particular relative, I usually visit her around the time of, you know, the memorial of my mom's passing and we kind of, we talk or we go for dinner, we do something together. Or, you know, there isn't, if that person isn't there, people may say, okay, well, what I usually do is I read a particular passage from the Quran or a particular um, dua, you know, and I, you know, say a few words of my own dua and my own supplication mm -hmm. and I just speak with Allah and that gives me some kind of spiritual relief or some kind of respite. So, this, you know, it's, it's what a person is aware of that they are comfortable with, but it's good to go through some type of action, some type of halal process that helps, uh, helps the way the person feels. Like, like, just a very example, when they say, just in regular psychology, you know, people who are depressed and they stay in their house, just having a bath, just the process of having a bath and putting on new clothes can shift their mood. If they were scoring a three out of 10, it can move them to a four or a five, mm. just by a physical action and, you know, going through, the, going through these particular motions can change the way that we think, the way that we, once we change the way that we think, we change the way that we feel. So when you talk about physical actions, um, someone who's lost their spouse or their mom, um, do, you, do you think that those physical actions can help them, you know, forget about the situation, forget about the loss of their mother, or do you feel like that it's still, it's still gonna, you know, hurt them for a very, very long time? I don't think it's about forgetting as much as it's about coping and dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, forgetting is an extremely 
difficult thing to do because if I tell somebody to forget about a red bus, all they can imagine is a red bus. So you, can, you know, when you try to forget things, it, it doesn't. The brain, the mind doesn't doesn't actually work like that. But also, um, it's more about dealing with the hurt, processing the hurt, as opposed to avoiding it. Because we're human beings, and we have certain like uh, there's a certain psychological, a certain emotional makeup to the human being, mm -hmm. and Allah has put that in us for a particular reason. And when put in certain situations or faced with certain life situations. We experience those things. We experience those emotions. And the, I would say, I would argue that the realistic goal isn't to deny them or to suppress them or to pretend they don't exist or to try and speed past them, but to be aware of them and how they influence our thoughts and actions as opposed to just um, trying to, to rid ourselves of them. So it's very much about a process and about coming to terms mm. with what's taken place. And do you believe that, you know, someone who's lost their mother or spouse um, to different kinds of you know different kinds of uh, causes of death so for example if someone lost their mother or spouse towards um, murder as opposed to someone who's lost it to natural causes mm -hmm. do you think that those have different uh, effects on the human being do you think they uh, give the person different um, different levels of emotions or do you think or do you think it's all the same i i am um, genuinely believe that the loss is a loss but then when it's coupled with a uh, you could say a more controversial type of loss then that that can uh, magnify the mm. pain and mm. the difficulty of, of coming to terms with that somebody who's like i said lost a, a person because of natural causes, a medical condition, accident, mm. is going to be different to somebody who their f family member, their loved one was a victim of, say, for example, torture mm. and then murder. They were imprisoned illegally or, you know, something mm. of this nature. The more horrific the death is, the more painful it's going to be, yeah. naturally, going to yeah, be yeah. painful yeah. for the, those that are left behind to mourn their loss. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for you, this uh, insightful discussion, Brother Bilal. Um, let's look at the uh, session that Brother Bilal had with uh, an anonymous uh, guest who had been a victim of losing their spouse. Assalamualaikum, brother. Alaikum salam. I'd like to welcome you to this one-to-one uh, -one segment, one-to-one -one session. And um, before we go into any uh, details, really, just acknowledge the sensitivity of the topic and uh, your courage for really um, sharing your story. No problem. I appreciate that. If we could start the, start off with the first talking point. My question is regarding the murder of your wife and how you came to came to terms with the actual loss. I mean, uh, it was a total shock. That morning she was there in front of me. We were having breakfast. And by the evening, she was gone. I had no idea what I had. I... I I'm taking her for granted and now she's, she's gone the worst thing is that I wasn't there I wish I could have been with her just, just to protect her save her I wish at least I could have been there to just be there for her final moments I hate the thought of her being in pain or scared the, the, the injustice is just it eats me away, it just kills me inside. I wanted to lock myself away. I want nothing to do with the world anymore. 
But I've got children. I, I had to stay strong mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. I thank God for them. That they are, they're like reminders and pieces of her. But I'll never forget the moment they realised that their mum, she wasn't coming home. You mentioned that you wished that you were there for her final moments. And that made me, that led me to think, was there something you would have said to her in her final moments had you been there? If I was there, I would, I would have, I would have asked for forgiveness if I knew she was gonna go. I mean, Sometimes that's what it takes, an extreme situation to bring out your real emotions, how you really feel about someone or something. I just, I just wish I could have stopped it from happening. And if I couldn't, at least she wouldn't have been alone. She wouldn't have died by herself. Imagine she was attacked and, and, and murdered. What was she going through? As if I couldn't have stopped it, at least I would have been there to give her some sort of comfort, some sort of solace. Mm -hmm. Maybe you say I'll find a goodbyes or something like that. But it wasn't to be. One of the emotions that people often feel when they lose somebody close is anger. And I wonder if you've had to deal with anger, if you've had to wrestle with anger, has that been a feature in your process? Indeed. It's like, think about it. Sometimes I feel I've been victimized. Why me? My wife didn't deserve to die. She didn't deserve to be murdered. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, nothing can change what's happened and nothing can bring her back. And yeah, anger has brewed at the situation. Sure. Me trying to accept that this is not going to change and there's nothing that I can do about it. It's just something I have to take on the chin, bite the bullet. I just, I don't even, I, it's really difficult even coming to terms with why was she the victim that night? Why did the killer choose her? Mm -hmm. So anger, I'm angry at a lot of things and also regretful for a lot of things because she's not here anymore and there's so much that I still want to say to her. Mm, it's very powerful, very, very powerful. What would you say? <laughs> how much I miss her. How much I wish I, I had fulfilled certain things and ambitions that we had, certain places we wanted to visit certain, you know, projects we wanted to do. Decorating, mm -hmm. painting, mm -hmm. couples retreats, visiting new exotic places, islands, rural beauty. And I just wish I could tell her that I wish she was here to help me on my development of becoming a better human being. And she's not gonna be able to witness that. And I don't have that mentor anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you being a father, um, you are a role model of sorts. So it sounds as if you haven't had a, you haven't had the option of not being strong, but you've had to be strong 
for your children? I had to be because I've lost my wife, but they've lost their mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're looking up to dad and they're thinking, daddy's going to take care of us. It don't matter that daddy's heart's broken. It don't matter that daddy's going through depression. Daddy's lonely. Daddy misses his wife. Because right now, their kids, they don't understand the complexities of human emotions at a mature level. Mm -hmm. And their life and their minds are a lot more simple. It's my duty to nurture and take care of this situation which has become a very critical point in their lives so that they receive the correct guidance the correct emotional support mm -hmm. and understanding and counselling for them to grow up without a mother to grow up with this tragedy and being able to digest and accept the events and to move forward to become beautiful human beings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I can feel a sense of uh, pride in myself rising when I heard you say, as a father having to wrestle with depression because it's a word that oftentimes people, particularly men, can be afraid of and it's only when we really own our vulnerabilities that we can then repair any damage that has taken place so I just wanted to um, you know acknowledge that I wanted to acknowledge that I wanted to move on to hoping that we can maybe find out how things were as we moved on from the first stage of the loss to now dealing with the injustice aspect, the legal system, and seeing her killers in court. It was very difficult. But I don't even like to think about it that much. I try to block it out of my mind sometimes. I mean, there I am searching for justice, but I got a look the men that you saw them I saw them yeah in the courtroom now I have to look at these people in the eyes in the faces they don't know who I am because I didn't identify myself in the courtroom but I know who they were and what they've done and I'm and these people were very, very intimidating. Now, I can't imagine what my wife had to go through. I mean, she's she's little and, and, and fragile, petite. Mm -hmm. And then I'm there staring at the people who have taken my wife away, who have destroyed my life, who have made my children motherless. I hate every minute of being in that courtroom. I'm not going to sit here and lie and say that I've forgiven this person or that person for what he has done. I don't know when I'll ever get near that stage of actually being able to accept and forgive and that stage of moving on. It's just, it just makes me realise how how different I am from the Ahlul Bayt and how the Ahlul Bayt were not only could they face the people who hurt and oppressed them they were just willing to be merciful I mean, that takes great courage great strength great acceptance and understanding of the dynamics of this world and human nature. Mm -hmm. Imam was saying, and he said, um, he could have turned Hor away. 
After all, he and his children were thirsty because of him. Yet the Imam didn't. Imam Hussein, he was even willing to forgive Shimr if he didn't kill the Imam. SubhanAllah. Mm -hmm. He was willing mm -hmm. to forgive his own killer. Mm -hmm. I can't even look at the killers of my wife in the eyes. If anything, I just feel sorry for the guy who murdered my wife. I mean, how hard can a heart, how hard can your heart be? How dark and how evil, or pardon my English, but how messed up do you have to be to take a life like that? One can only truly unless they've walked in your shoes only imagine what you have been through and what you are still going through um, you mentioned something which was so important I wanted to just expand on it just a little bit when you mentioned about forgiveness the forgiveness that was exemplified and demonstrated by Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his family members in different situations and there is so much evidence now come into the fore about how forgiveness is a healer for us the victim for those who are victims because the body remembers as they say and so many toxins and cancers and so many diseases are actually you know this ease is created in our nervous system in our bodies based on holding on to grudges and grievances and anger and, and malice but being realistic as fallible human beings, it's it's got to be done, I guess, in our own time, and it's not something that a expert or a well wisher can instruct you to come to a place of forgiveness. It's something that you have to wrestle with yourself in your own time, in your own way, in your own space. I wonder if you could. Say a bit more about your, I guess, because you have this experience now, and if you could maybe tie that into your knowledge of history of how it could have been in some respects for our first Imam when his wife was a victim of violence and what transpired as a result of that in terms of the losses that you know eventually came about because of those acts of violence. I mean, when I was told to read about Imam Ali salam, in the aftermath of the martyrdom of Fatah Zahra salam, I saw the Imam in a completely new light. I had been used to this, this warrior, this man of prestige, honor and, and presence. And I was used to the, the hardened Ali ibn Abi Talib on the battlefield and had overlooked his affection towards his wife, mm. his relationship with his sons and his daughters. Okay. Okay. He adored his wife. She was his light. And that is exactly how it was with me and my wife. She was my everything. She was your light. She was your she light. Was that, she that, was your she light. She was my sunshine. The thing I woke up to. I think that is just a perfect place to end our conversation and thank you so much for sharing and joining me in this one to one Welcome back. Uh, thank you very much for staying with us, um, Brother Bilal. You know, looking at that video, and you know, you having that personal discussion with that anonymous person. Um, you know, how 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 must have that person have felt? You know, it's very tragic to lose a spouse, and especially to murder. Um, do you come across this uh, sort of stuff often? 
um, I wouldn't say often in terms of uh, family members who are victims of murder, but I have. And I think we mentioned it earlier on that the loss is a big thing, period. But then when it's uh, coupled with um, violence or con and, and controversy, that can make it all the more difficult to process. So on one level, we could you know, only imagine the type of um, impact that situation, you know, the historical situation mm -hmm. would have had on, on Imam Ali, alayhi yeah. salam, and his children. Mm. But we're, we're somewhat comforted by his knowledge, mm. his impeccable knowledge, his impeccable wisdom and, and implementation of Islam that somebody of his, his character would have been able to handle it much, you know, much more effectively than, than, yeah. than us as lay, lay people, you know. Mm. And, you know, going towards the video, um, the, the brother mentions that he, he talks about how um, he lost his spouse to murder and how he saw the, his, uh, the, the killers. The perpetrators, in, yep, yeah. Yep, the perpetrators yep. in, in the courtroom. And when he goes on to link it to uh, Imam Hussein and Imam Ali alayhi salam, where he says that he saw the killers, Imam Ali saw the killers. You know, Imam Hussein at Karbala, he knew the pe the cause, the people who caused this, and then he just remembers them, and then he just you know sits stands back and he looks at how they forgave, how Hurub, how Imam Hussein forgave Hurub bin Yazid al Riyahi, how Imam Ali forgave uh, the kill uh, some of the killers of. Um, you know, he didn't hold any grudges against them. Um, I think that's that requires a great level of iman and yaqeen, don't mm -hmm. you think? No, no, no doubt, no doubt. But also bringing it up to today, because we, I guess, we have to make those historical events relevant to our here and our now. We all we have to do is reflect on the magnitude of that loss, and then we think, okay, what about the brother? that has said something unkind about us or we had a disagreement with a particular sister or a particular family member or a particular friend so I'm not talking to that person anymore because they said I'm a so-and-so or she thinks she's cute or he said this or he into that and that's a smaller ask isn't it to forgive yeah and to move on and to move past that so maybe we could take some kind of uh some sort of type of lesson as a plan of action to go forward with forgiveness is is healthy yeah, um, I just feel like uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam was, you know, his his patience at that at that moment was impeccable, mm -hmm. and you know when people say um, why could why didn't Imam Ali alayhi salam do anything? Well, he he did it for the sake of the religion of Islam, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is a very very beautiful thing. Uh, but. Thank you very much, Brother Bilal, for that insightful discussion. It's been a pleasure, bro. It's been thank a pleasure. you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you next time. And until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If you've been affected by the following topics raised in this episode, please contact your local GP or Fahima Muhammad on coachfm1 at hotmail.com.